Hi, it's good to see you. My name is Jeff Palmberg, and I'm the pastor here at Community Covenant Church in Twist, Washington. And I'm glad you're able to join me for today's message here on Sunday, April 7th. Last week, we celebrated Easter. It's the culmination, the focal point of our faith, because through Jesus' death and then resurrection on that Easter morning, God completely defeated sin, death, and the devil and his influence and impact on our lives. He freed us. And as a result, we experience salvation. God is now no longer focused or concerned about that earning our salvation that's done. It's been handled. And so for those of us who have received this gift of salvation, now God's focus is to help you and I to become more and more like Jesus. That's his focus. And if we are those who have received God as our Savior then, and Jesus as our Savior, then we need to be focused on that as well. How can I become more and more like my Savior? We're beginning this new series um, that we're calling A Fruitful Life. Jesus often used agrarian imagery because he was living in this agrarian culture, and it was easy for people to relate to that. And specifically, he talked about grapes, and vineyards. In John 15, we have this passage where Jesus taught, and he says, I am the true grapevine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit, and he prunes the branches that do bear fruit, so they will produce even more. You have already been pruned and purified by the message that I have given you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it's severed from the vine, and you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Yes, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. When you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples. This brings great glory to my Father. So the key in this teaching of Jesus is really summarized in these last verses here. Those who remain in this vital relationship with Jesus are going to then experience that there's a lot of fruit that is shown in their life. And producing fruit, producing this, is the evidence that we are truly Jesus' disciples. It's an evidence to the others in, that we encounter, and it brings glory to God. So the natural question is, what in the world is Jesus talking about bearing much fruit? What does that mean? Well, using staying in this um, analogy of a fruit of grapevine, you don't have bananas growing off a grapevine because the fruit that grows is directly related to what kind of plant that is. If it's a grapevine, you're going to have grapes. Jesus said that he is the vine, and we are the branches, and then the fruit that is produced is the fruit that is connected to Jesus. It's the stuff that Jesus is all about, the, the characteristics and the qualities of Jesus. Um, so, we will resemble Jesus in the things that are shown in our lives, as long as we're connected to him. So what are these character traits of Jesus that we're talking about? Well, you could do this giant, you know, study pouring through Scripture and try to identify, okay, Jesus had all these kind of, he was like this, he was like this, he did this, he did that. And you could come up, compile your list after a lot of searching. But the shortcut is that it's already been spelled out for us by the Apostle Paul. In Galatians chapter 5, Paul wrote, But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There's no law against these things. Now, you probably know of these as the fruit of the Spirit. Notice, Scripture does not call these the fruits of the Spirit. This fruit is singular word. In other words, it tells us that all of these characteristics together are the fruit, the single work of the Holy Spirit 
together creating this. These are the characteristics of Christ. So what that also tells us is that we can't approach this list like a shopping list. We're like, okay, I'm going to go to the store. I'm going to pick out what I want. So you're not going to be able to go in there and say, yeah, okay, I want some love and, and some joy, but uh, skip the peace, skip the patience. Oh, kindness is good. No, you can't pick and choose one over the other. All of these together are what God wants to create in us because it's about a reflection of who Jesus is. And we are in this process of becoming more and more like him. Um, here's the reality. We all come to Christ as broken, helpless, sinful people. And we, yet even in that condition, we are accepted just as we are. God loves us. He doesn't make us earn his love or somehow be deserving of being saved. But the good news is that God is not content to leave us in that broken state that he first receives us. He welcomes us into his family, adopted into his family, but now it's about creating in us something bigger, a bigger dream of becoming much better than what we were and leaving the past behind. In Romans 8, 29, oh, sorry. Um, so here's the first dog that my family got was uh, this little uh, Maltese Lhasa Apso mix that we named Dee Dee. Got her from the Humane Society, the pound in Kalamazoo. And uh, we brought her home and she was much loved. And uh, yet she was a mess. So we took her to a groomer and she got an extreme makeover and uh, became this little, you know, prissy little doggy here. <laughs> um, God feels the same way about us. He doesn't want to leave us in the broken condition. He finds us and adopts us into his family. He wants to help us to become something bigger than what we dreamed of and somebody, something we couldn't be on our own so that we become more and more like Jesus in his image. So in Romans 8, 29, it says, For God knew his people in advance, and he chose them to become like his son so that his son would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. God knew he was going to choose you to come and be a part of his family, to adopt us into his family, to make us co-heirs with Jesus, and to become like Christ ourself. Um, so it's not about superficial changes. It's not like putting on a smiley face mask and sort of pretending. No, this is about real transformation that our character, the very essence of who we are, becomes transformed by God's work in us. It's an extreme makeover of our own. And we become have a real family resemblance, not a superficial one. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul writes, So all of us who have been who have had that veil removed can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. And the Lord who is spirit makes us more and more like him as we are changed into his glorious image. You see this process that God is at work, transforming us. You know, it's like the illustration I used last week of your Easter message about these color corrective glasses that enable somebody who's colorblind to suddenly see colors and the full range spectrum of colors in this world for the first time. We, it's like, having a veil removed, suddenly we have this thing that's holding us back to see and fully experience God's glory and God's presence with us, but then also experience it transforming us and that we've been set free so we can experience the fullness, the abundant life that God planned for us. And we can see his glory and we can reflect it because God is transforming us to be more and more like him. It's the Holy Spirit who resides within us who is doing this work. So let's acknowledge, though, that there's an internal battle that we all face. Since we know ourselves perfectly, we also know all of our shortcomings. We know all of the things that, that we don't even live up to our own expectations. Even as believers, we constantly are aware, and maybe even more so, we're aware of those rebelliousness in our life and those times where we turn away from God's way. Because now we have 
clear understanding. We have the clear vision that Christ has given to us. I know too many Christians who have this kind of attitude where even though they've got this, they go, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. Well, is that true? It's only partly true. You and I were lost in our sin brokenness. And that meant we had no hope to be good enough to earn God's love on our own. And we have been saved by his grace. That is undeserved. It is his graciousness, gift to us. And that means that we have forgiveness, we have adoption into his family that we didn't deserve. We are not sinners anymore. We were sinners. Now we are saints. Now, that seems like kind of extreme. Really, can I call myself a saint? Really, that doesn't, I mean, saints are perfect. They, you know, have, they come with a little halo glowing and they, you know, hover a foot off the ground. They're not regular humans. Um, and I mess up daily. How could I be called a saint? Well, listen, a saint means to be set apart, sanctified, made righteous. righteous. Now, notice, these are acts of God. God sets us apart. God sanctifies. God makes us righteous. It's not our effort in our work. It is God's work. And when we give our lives to Christ, he exchanges our sin nature, our, our broken sin state separated from God, and he gives us his righteousness. It was an exchange on the cross. Jesus took the sin of us that we deserve to have to pay, and he took it upon himself, and he exchanged his righteousness for us. Ephesians 3 says, I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all of the Lord's holy people, which is also translated saints. That's what it says there to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know his love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. This is who God already knows we are. We are God's holy, holy people. We are saints because of what Christ has done on our behalf and taking our sin, giving us his righteousness. And now God wants us to fully grasp God, the fullness of God's love and to be filled to the measure of the fullness of God, this transforming process. So any thoughts that you have of, I'm no good, I couldn't possibly be loved by God, um, I'm never going to be any different, this is just who I am, I just got to accept my sin nature and my sinfulness, those are lies. Those are lies from the enemy. Satan is known as the accuser, it's one of his titles. He is all about being the father of lies, another one of his titles. In contrast, the Holy Spirit fills us with his truth. He is the spirit of truth, Jesus said. And he is the source of God's power. And God is in us working from the inside out and transforming us into the image of Christ, of who he is intending us to become. So, as we start to embrace this extreme makeover of the Holy Spirit working in us to give us this fruitful life, um, the first thing we need to do is to reject the lies and to start believing the truth. We replace the lies that have been shoveled onto us and just thrown at us for our entire life, a lifetime of believing lies. I mean, you know, then you just accept it. No. The only way that a lie loses its power is when you replace it with the truth. So we need to start replacing his lies with the truth. Um, the fruitfulness happens when we get rid of the things that are blocking us from being able to experience everything that God wants for us. And getting rid of the lies is first. I have a uh, connection a link that you can pick up um, this list 
of who you are in Christ. In Christ, you are completely accepted. You are completely secure in Christ. He's not going to turn his back on you. You're going to tentatively, oh, I messed up. Now God's going to throw me in hell. No. And you're also significant. God has work to do in you. I want to encourage you to take time to work your way through this list of all the things that are true. I am God's child. I am Christ's friend. I have been justified. I'm united with the Lord. And there's scriptures to read these and to let them fill you with truth, to replace the lies that Satan would otherwise have you believe. Because when you know the truth, scripture says the truth will set you free. So take time to do this. And I would maybe you want to use this as a devotional time that daily you take a look at one of these things. So let, read up, look up the scripture. Consider what it's saying about you, the truth. Take time to reflect on it. Talk about it to God. Oh, how would I understand this? What is what does this mean? If I really believe this, how would it change my attitude? How would it change how I, I'm living my life? Um, pray through it and allow the truth to soak over you so that you become completely filled with his truth as opposed to the lies. It's the first step so that we can experience the fruitful life that God has for us. Because it is the fruit of the Spirit, these qualities of Jesus, that the Spirit is the one who is doing the difference. We aren't expected to strain really hard and go, Ugh! there I produce love. Joy. No, no, no. That's even if, even if we tried to do that, we wouldn't be able to. Um, it is called the fruit of the Spirit for the reason that it's the Spirit who does the work. We are simply called to stay connected to the vine, stay connected to Jesus. So that's where we spend time with Him, spend time reading Scripture and His truth. So, you know, again, back to that, those lists, take time. The more that you understand and start building the truth in your life, the stronger that connection will be to Christ and the more access we have to what the Holy Spirit wants to be doing and producing in us, not by our own efforts, but by his action in us. And then we will find that the fruit of the Spirit will become more and more evident in our life because suddenly we go, oh, because I'm connected to Christ who is love, I am more loving because I'm connected to Christ, who is joy. I am more joyful because he is the Prince of Peace. I feel peace too because I'm connected to him and it's growing in me. All of these things will be true because the Spirit is working in us to transform us to be more in the image of Christ. You know, it's like uh, Keith Green um, back in the day saying, um, remember, he is divine and you are to branch. He'd love to get you through it. If you'd give him the chance, just keep doing your best and pray that it's blessed. And Jesus takes care of the rest. Our goal is to stay connected. Stay connected. He's divine and we're to branch. <laughs> so focus on your connection to Christ because then it's just the natural progress and the natural production that happens of the qualities of Christ because we are connected to him and the Holy Spirit has full access to do exactly what he alone can do. Let's pray. God, we thank you for the hope that we have in you. It's a hope not just for um, our someday being in heaven with you. It's a hope for a life right now that is full, abundant life, that is fruitful, full of the same character traits that you demonstrated in your life that you want us to be a part of as well. We are ready and anxious to experience everything of you in our lives every day. And we are so grateful that it is your spirit who does the work. Our job is to stay connected. Your job is to grow these characteristics in us, these character traits. And the more that we allow these things to be a part of who we are, then the more evidence it will be to the world that we're your followers and more attractive will our lives be to point people towards you, our Savior and Lord, and potentially our friends, Savior and Lord. Lord, we thank you that it is your work and your blessing and your promise to produce that abundant life. Lord, help us to fill our minds and hearts with the truth 
and help us to do that in a way that keeps us connected so that your work of your spirit can continue and accomplish everything that you intended to. You're the one who takes care of the rest. We stay connected to you. We praise and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So God bless you in this coming week. I do encourage you to, to click on the connection so that you can get this list of who you are in Christ and start filling your mind with the truth that will counter all of the lies of Satan, all of his accusations against us that are completely untrue. Allow God's truth to expel all the lies and to transform you, to give you freedom and to experience the fullness of what Jesus wants to be doing in your life. Take care and hope to see you soon. Bye-bye.